For a long time, society has been quick to brand people with ADHD as unreliable, impulsive, and disruptive. But it's a lack of support and education about ADHD that's the real problem. Without the right tools, ADHD means a huge loss of talent, ingenuity, and creativity for the world. And it can mean unhappiness, poor mental health, and reduced life expectancy for individuals. When the right support is available, however, that story is different. ADHD can become a powerful asset that propels individuals toward success and fulfillment. My name is Inez, and in this blink to ADHD 2.0 by Dr. Edward M. Hallowell and Dr. John J. Rady, we'll start by shedding a light on what's happening inside the brains of people with ADHD and the influence this has on how they experience the world. Then, we'll explore four strategies that anyone can use to unlock ADHD as a superpower. If you or someone you care about has ADHD, you'll have heard some of those negative stereotypes. There's the socially awkward kid who disrupts the class, the spouse who's constantly late and forgets appointments, the employee who'd be a workplace star if they could just get their act together. And that's not really fair. Because people with ADHD are many other things, too. They're the kid whose projects are amazing when they're interested in the subject matter. Or the partner who loves more fiercely than anyone else you know. Or the colleague who comes up with a brilliant solution seemingly out of nowhere. Yes, they may be impulsive, hyperactive, and distractible, but they have important qualities that outweigh this. An ADHD brain makes you energized, creative, fearless in the face of problems that no one else wants to deal with, and committed to seeing whatever you're invested in through, no matter what. And these are some of the many gifts ADHD brings to the world. In fact, you could see it as a superpower. To unleash its full potential, it helps to understand what's going on inside that dynamic brain, and then put some strategies into practice to get the most out of it. We're going to explore those strategies a bit later on, but first, let's take a look at what makes these brains in particular such a hive of activity. We've recently learned a lot about how different brains function thanks to the development of fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. This new technology lets us watch the brain in action, kind of like a moving x-ray. It's helped scientists identify two key modes of thinking They're connected and act like a seesaw with each other. The first of those is TPN, which stands for Task Positive Network. This type of thinking happens when you're immersed in a task, in the zone, so to speak. When TPN is in play, you pretty much forget everything except what you're doing. If you experience hyperfocus, you'll know how that feels. It's also the reason why you sometimes can't step away from what you're doing. The second mode of thinking is DMN, or default mode network. This is the realm of the imagination. It allows you to look back, drawing on past experiences, and look forward to imagined plans or outcomes. When you're in DMN, you might be innovating or solving problems. And TPN and DMN are designed to tag team each other, which keeps us balanced between getting things done and dreaming up the next big thing. The challenge for people with ADHD is that their brain doesn't switch between the two modes as seamlessly or regularly as other people's brains. This makes you susceptible to getting stuck in one mode, and that can lead to all kinds of consequences. Getting stuck in TPN might mean you're so engrossed in a task that you forget your other obligations. Picking up the kids from school, going to an important work meeting, meeting the person you're dating. Or, in DMN, your imagination can lead you into dark places, making you fixate on failures, disappointments, and shame that you might have experienced because of your ADHD. The other recent discovery we've made about ADHD brains is that a strip down the center of their cerebellum is smaller than in other brains. Now that's important because the cerebellum is the part of your brain that looks after motor function as well as cognitive and emotional processes. 
It's responsible for split-second decisions, balance, and coordination. Luckily, your cerebellum is also the most plastic part of your brain, which means that with some understanding and commitment, you can strengthen it and overcome some of those challenges ADHD causes. So, what does all of this mean in practical terms? Well, the best way to think of an ADHD brain is that it has the engine of a race car, but the brakes of a push bike. That's why it's running a mile a minute and you can't seem to slow it down. But there are four distinct strategies that can help you strengthen those brakes over time. And it's when those brakes are nice and strong that you'll be able to tap into the enormous potential of your superpower brain. These strategies are adaptable for adults and kids, so they'll interest you whether you have ADHD yourself or you're supporting a loved one, like a child with ADHD. And as I said, we'll get to those, I promise. But before we delve into them, I want to share a case study. We'll be talking about this case study as we explore the strategies because it really shows how they can work. So it's about Samuel, a seven-year-old boy living in Shanghai with his mother, Lily. One of the authors of this book, Dr. Hallowell, met Lily after giving a talk about his and Dr. Rady's first book, Driven to Distraction, which is also about ADHD. Lily told Hallowell that her son exhibited all the classic characteristics he'd mentioned in his speech. Samuel was struggling to focus in school, he couldn't follow instructions, and his grades were slipping. And worse, he was getting sadder every day. Since there were no local professionals to help Samuel, Hallowell agreed to treat him remotely by drawing up a treatment plan for Lily to follow. And because there wasn't a local psychiatrist who could prescribe medication for Samuel, Hallowell would be relying on other treatment methods to help this little boy thrive. That's not to say that medication isn't a good treatment for some people. It just wasn't an option at this time. Hallowell's plan centered around the idea that Samuel needed to strengthen the brakes on his race car brain. The first step of the treatment plan might surprise you. Lily was asked to give Samuel lots of hugs each day to counter the punishment he was receiving at school. She was told to ground all her interactions with him in warmth and kindness. Each day, Lily would tell Samuel that she believed in him, that all he needed to do was strengthen his brakes and he'd be a success. Hallowell also prescribed daily balancing exercises. Every day, for 30 minutes, Samuel would do a range of exercises that Hallowell sent instructions for, from standing on one leg with his eyes closed to taking his socks on and off without sitting down. In essence, that was it. Lily was dedicated and motivated. She got her husband and Samuel's school on board, and within weeks, her little boy was more focused and less disruptive. His progress was actually so impressive that everyone started asking Lily what her secret was. She told them there was no secret. She just found a strategy that worked better than punishment, a strategy that focused on Samuel's strengths instead of shaming him for his behavior. With that as our inspiration, let's keep looking at how strength-based strategies work. People with ADHD are prone to disconnection no matter how old they are. It's not hard to imagine why. If your brain functions differently to 90% of the population, you're going to feel confused and out of step with everyone else. Disconnection is the cause of so much pain for people with ADHD. It can lead to anxiety, poor performance at work, relationship difficulties, and acting out at school. And in many schools, the consequences for kids acting out only makes them feel more alienated. In Samuel's case, he was punished, felt shame as a result, and then withdrew because of that shame. All this does is encourage kids to put up even thicker walls between themselves and the rest of the world, leading to low self-esteem, anxiety, and depression. And by the time kids reach adulthood, it becomes even more challenging to tear those walls down. And that's why Dr. Hallowell focused so much of his treatment plan for Samuel on connection, the foundation of that strength-based strategy. 
He believes that kids with ADHD need boundless connection every single day and throughout the day. Lily, Samuel's mom, implemented that by initiating lots of cuddles and telling Samuel how much she loved him and reading to him each night. Her husband also joined in and gave Samuel lots of extra hugs. What this did was flood Samuel with what Hallowell calls the other vitamin C, connection. Whether you're an adult or a child, it's important not to dismiss its power. Fear and shame are the biggest barriers to learning, and connection is kind of like the antidote. Connection is so potent that it can even mitigate childhood pain. If you have kids of your own, it can create a better childhood for them. In fact, the biggest gift you can give yourself or anyone else is a life filled with diverse connections. And remember, connection doesn't just happen on its own. It's important to actively practice it. So let's talk about how. First and foremost, make it a rule that worrying is never a solo activity. If you share your worries with someone you trust, you'll quickly find yourself in problem-solving mode, which eases the burden and identifies solutions while keeping that loneliness at bay. Also, if you live with other people, use meal times as a way to connect. Whether it's family members or housemates around the table, just make a point of sitting down together. Invite friends to join you. You should also foster at least two meaningful friendships. Make sure to connect with these friends each week. That could mean a regular lunch date or an evening phone call. And connection doesn't have to stop with the people that you know. Say hello to those people that you see all the time but might not count as your close friends. Like a barista at your local cafe or the trainers at your gym. Kind of just stops you from being another anonymous face in the crowd. If you're supporting a child with ADHD, Block off 30 minutes of one-on-one time each week to do whatever your child wants to do. That special dedicated time will do wonders for your relationship. Organizing a sleepover for some friends from school will also help your child connect with peers. And if ADHD is part of your household, consider getting a pet. I can tell you firsthand, a furry sidekick guarantees a hearty dose of vitamin C each day. If you were a kid with ADHD like Samuel, you were probably in a lot of trouble at school. You may have been labeled as naughty because you were disruptive or lazy because you were never motivated to do your work. This happened because teachers didn't understand that you have a race car engine in your brain. Race cars are powerful. They're designed to go fast. Adrenaline, risk, and boundary pushing is their thing. They're not meant to be used for a drive to the local grocery store any more than a family sedan is meant for the Grand Prix. That's why it's so hard for people with ADHD to sit quietly and fall into line, either at school or in many work environments. Because of this, the extraordinary talents of people with ADHD are often at risk of lying dormant or being dismissed. Typically, people with ADHD have one or two things that they're exceptional at or passionate about. And when you can identify those talents or interests, you can finally put that race car to good use. So that's why it's so important to take that strength-based approach to managing ADHD, basically nurturing your superpower. Say you have a child with ADHD, and you know they're obsessed with science or video games or playing the cello. Share that with their classroom teacher. If the teacher can integrate these interests into your child's classwork, something magical will happen. They'll stop or at least be much less disruptive, and they'll be motivated to do their work because they're interested in what they're learning. Kids with ADHD aren't naughty or lazy. They just need adults to engage them effectively. When this happens, the relationship between the teacher and your child will improve too, which makes everyone happier. This is why identifying your interests is the second of Hallowell's strategies to managing ADHD. If you're an adult, it's crucial that your job involves your interests somehow. Otherwise, you'll end up bored and unmotivated and your performance will naturally suffer. 
Poor performance in the workplace leads to anxiety, shame, and depression. And then you might end up in that default mode network thinking, or DMN, which we explored earlier. So if you're not sure what your interests and talents are, write a list of everything you're good at, what achievements you're most proud of, what you love to do, and what you'd like to get better at. Also, think about those things that you find easy that other people kind of struggle with. Use this list to assess whether there are ways to better align what you do at work with your interests and strengths. Ideally, you should be spending your work hours doing something you like and that you're good at. This is where you'll do your best work and be your happiest and most engaged. And if you can't find any scope for alignment, it might be time to start looking for work that makes better use of your talents. Keep in mind that creativity is an innate part of having ADHD. Whether your interests are writing a book, carpentry, or turning your latest invention into a marketable product, creativity is an itch you just have to scratch. When you center your work around your drive to create, those superpowers we talked about, they'll shine. The environment you're in will have a huge impact on whether or not you flourish. We saw this in the case study about little Samuel. By following Hallowell's treatment plan, Lily turned Samuel's home environment into a safe, loving place where his ADHD was accepted and valued. She was also able to influence the school environment by sharing what she'd learned about ADHD and advocating for a more supportive approach. But your environment is more than just the physical spaces you move through. It spans everything from routine to diet. Obviously, you won't be able to change every aspect of every environment you're in. But there's always scope for some change to better support yourself or someone with ADHD. Now, it'd be easy to instinctively resist what I share with you next, but give it a chance. You want to start taking charge of your environment by introducing more structure. The ADHD brain is hardwired to resist structure, so this could be a challenge. But the secret is to start small setting yourself up for success. To-do lists are a great way to introduce structure into your day. Just the act of writing them reinforces the importance of those items in your brain. Begin with just two tasks each day and try your best to complete those. Ticking them off the list will give you a hit of self-satisfaction that'll keep you motivated. Over time, start adding more items to your daily list. Next, think about the home, education, and work environments you're in. Are they fear and shame-free? Are the rules and expectations clear? Do they promote open dialogue and engagement? Or are there hierarchies you need to bow down to? And importantly, do you feel valued in them? If not, what can you change to improve these environments? And if the answer is nothing, it might be time to move on. Your environment includes what you eat, so reflect on your diet. You wouldn't put low-grade fuel in a race car and expect it to perform. So are you doing this to your brain? We're best fueled by unprocessed foods that are free from additives, preservatives, colorings, and sugar. Try to stick to whole grains, unprocessed meats, fish, nuts, and as much fresh fruit and vegetables as possible. Ditch that sugary soda, limit coffee, and stick to water or tea instead. You'll be performing at your best this way. Finally, prioritize quality sleep. People with ADHD are prone to FOMO, that fear of missing out. It keeps you at parties or online longer than is good for you. Your race car engine needs its downtime to work well. Quality sleep will offset the risk of low mood or anxiety that DMN, the default mode network, might cause. Optimize your sleep by switching off all devices at least an hour before bedtime and ban them from your bedroom. Keep your room dark and cool, but not cold. We all know how much easier it is to tackle a challenge after a decent sleep, so it's worth doing yourself that favor. We've now covered three of Hallowell's four strategies that formed his treatment plan for little Samuel. That's connection, 
tapping into strengths and interests, and creating supportive environments. But what we haven't covered are those balancing exercises that Hallowell prescribed. Hallowell's treatment plan included specific balancing exercises because he knew from Lily that Samuel was already getting plenty of physical activity. He played soccer regularly and got plenty of traditional exercise, so his heart and other muscles were getting a good workout each week. Continuing this level of activity was a crucial component of Samuel's treatment because exercise releases dopamine, which helps concentration. But Samuel also needed some tailored exercises to target the area of his brain that needed the most support. Remember at the beginning of this blink, we looked at how part of the cerebellum, which manages our cognitive and emotional responses as well as fine motor movement, is a bit smaller in people with ADHD. Well, when Samuel did 30 minutes of balancing exercises every day, he was giving this part of his brain a workout. Don't forget, your cerebellum is the most plastic part of your brain, so you can beef it up kind of in the same way that you could improve your pecs by doing push-ups. People with ADHD will benefit from any exercise that involves balancing, but martial arts is a particularly good option. It combines balance with coordination, discipline, and focus. But if that doesn't appeal to you so much, yoga is also a good alternative. It's another practice that fosters focus and balance, forcing you to concentrate on your body's alignment. Some forms also have cardio exercises, so you can get that beneficial dopamine hit. 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise every day is all it takes to get those neurons firing. If you add balancing practices to your regular routine, you can actually renovate your brain. In just eight weeks, you might notice that your stress levels are lower, You'll also have thickened the smaller part of your cerebellum, which is in charge of learning, memory, and emotional regulation. All areas that people with race car brains need a bit of extra support with. Exercise can also be a really helpful short-term tool when you feel those push bike brakes failing. If you're struggling to focus on a task, raising your heart rate by going on a quick jog, doing some jumping jacks, or even just putting on a good song and dancing it out They can give you that quick dopamine hit, which makes it easier to concentrate. Many schools are actually using this technique now. Some teachers have started getting kids to jump on mini trampolines instead of sending them to the principal if they've been disruptive. If your child has ADHD, you might want to swap your time out with an impromptu workout. And if you have ADHD, you might want to consider that concept too. You'll be amazed by the difference it makes. In short, what you should know after listening to this blink of ADHD 2.0 by Dr. Edward M. Hallowell and Dr. John J. Rady is that people with ADHD have an essential role to play. They're creative, energetic, entrepreneurial, and love a challenge. We need people like this to innovate and tackle big issues. With the right tools and support in place, they can harness that power in their brain and release their own brand of brilliance onto the world making it a better place and helping them reach their full potential. And if you have ADHD and you're finding yourself in the clutches of negative thoughts, it might mean you're stuck in that default mode network thinking, imagining or planning but struggling to be concrete. To switch your brain back to TPN, or task positive network mode, do a task that's based outside your head, like walking the dog, chopping a carrot, or doing a puzzle doesn't really matter what you do. The point isn't to be productive. It's to click out of one mode of thinking and into another. DMN is seductive, and it'll try to keep hold of you. But if you can fire up a different set of neurons by doing something, anything really, you can release yourself. Thank you for listening.